Uh, good day to everyone, wherever you're located. Uh, thank you for attending uh, today's SPSP webinar. Uh, uh, this is June's seminar. Uh, this is our fifth seminar of this year. Uh, as always, this seminar is sponsored by Sedgwick Brand Protection, and we thank uh, Sedgwick for their support of uh, this program and all the programs this year. Uh, we will take a pause in July and August uh, on the webinar series, and then uh, in September, start in again, and we'll have uh, four remaining uh, webinars uh, through the end of the year. Uh, September's webinar will involve uh, the product safety toolkit developed by Kids in Danger, uh, which if you haven't seen the original version, they have a new uh, uh, update uh, coming out. And uh, I think you'll find it very interesting. And you will receive information on that in an announcement at our newsletter. Um, today's program is very important for anyone selling internationally, of course. However, it is also important for anyone just selling in the United States if similar products are sold by other companies in foreign countries. While the main focus today is on the European uh, regulatory and liability requirements, uh, you should also be aware of risks that might occur for products you sell in the United States. For example, there are standards in Europe which would require you to design your product more safely to sell in Europe than would be required in the US. Well, what are the risks if you do that? You are in effect selling a safer product in Europe than the product you sell in the US. And plaintiff's lawyers love those situations because they're gonna argue that you can make a safer product, that you sell a safer product, but that you don't sell it in the United States. So because there's so many more standards in Europe than there are in the US, uh, but less liability uh, risk, uh, there's really a different focus in Europe versus the US. So you need to be aware of uh, the risks uh, if you have different levels of safety. And if you have a safer product that's sold in Europe and not the US, what are the risks of doing that? Um, so the message today is that you want to think internationally. You want to evaluate all your risks, whether it's U.S. or or, uh, or Europe. In Europe, it may be more of a regulatory risk than a product liability risk, and in the U.S., the opposite, more product liability than regulatory. But when you think about the products you make and sell and how you sell them, how you design them, the standards you comply with, you want to think about the risks in all areas where you're selling products in particular. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I want to turn it over to uh, three terrific speakers that we have. You've seen their, their backgrounds, uh, Jamie Humphreys, uh, Ed Turtle, Fergal Duggan, and they are with the uh, Cooley uh, Law Firm. Uh, Cooley uh, Law Firm is, uh, the product safety group is, is headed by Rod Freeman, who I think you're all familiar with. Uh, Rod, I assume you're listening in on uh, on this program, and uh, thank you for making them available to us. Uh, but I think you'll also find that that uh, all three of them are uh, real experts, and uh, and uh, very will be very helpful in describing the important developments in Europe that are about to occur, and that you need to be aware of. So with that in mind, uh, let's get started. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jamie to uh, get started on this program. Thank you. Thanks, Ken, for the kind introductions. Um, and to all of you for having us today to talk about some important developments in Europe that we expect to have a big global impact. So in terms of what to expect today, um, I'll just cover off some brief in introductions in a moment. And then Ed will talk to you about the current drivers for reform across the EU. Fergal will speak to the new uh, general product safety regulation, and I'll say a few words on the proposal for the revision of the product liability directive. For that, we're back to Ed to talk about the EU's representative actions regime. And then we'll then finish off with some questions moderated by Ken. Um, before we kick off, I'll just give you a quick background to the work we do at Cooley, and before handing off to the team to make their own introductions. So as Ken said, the team um, is led by Rod Freeman, who many of you will know, and we specialize in all things products. So we work with clients all the way through the product life cycle. So that uh, means working through the design and production phases. So our clients look to understand their legal obligations leading up to placing products on the market, particularly whether they're novel products or there are no existing rules in place. Uh, we advise on labeling, packaging and end of life requirements, 
often dealing with specific circular economy concerns. And we also help clients with their consumer law obligations, such as consumer rights and warranties. And then once products are out in the wild, we also work with clients who are facing claims or dealing with compliance or safety issues. Now, a large part of what we do is helping clients manage product safety and liability issues. And that can range from internal or regulatory investigations to global corrective actions. And on the litigation side, we defend consumer law and product liability claims. So as product law is seeing an unprecedented period of change at the moment, as we'll come to shortly, we increasingly help clients understand what those policy changes will mean for them. So truly a one-stop product shop. Now, for my part, I've been a lawyer for 15 years, started as a litigator. Much of the last half of my career has been dedicated to products law. While I advise on the whole products lifecycle, I have particular expertise in the more contentious side. So covering product safety investigations and recalls, regulatory investigations, and product liability and consumer law disputes. I love new technology, so I'm looking forward to talking about the product, uh, the proposed PLD today. Now, I'll hand over to Ed for a brief introduction. Thanks very much, Jamie. Um, so uh, my name's Ed Turple. I sit in uh, Cooley's international uh, products team. Like uh, Jamie, I have a bit of a mix of uh, product regulatory and, uh, and product liability work in my in my practice. Uh, I started uh, as a product uh, liability lawyer um, over a decade ago. I cut my teeth um, doing class actions in, in, in the US and, and Canada um, and have since um, uh, actually a range of different um, uh, proceedings across, across Europe. Um, but I spend a lot of my time nowadays um, advising on um, uh, innovative technologies uh, and policy issues um, uh, concerning the, the sort of developments that are coming out of, out of Europe. Uh, so I will hand over uh, to Fergal, who can say uh, his own introduction. Hi all, uh, it's great to be here with, with you today. Um, my last webinar was attended by three people, so we have a significant upgrade of, of 85 currently. I'm delighted about that. Um, and like Jamie and Ed, I'm a member of the international products team, and I, I sit in, in London, our London office. Uh, I, I operate over the entire product life cycle as well, and I am particularly interested in new technologies and also the, the kind of overlap between uh, kind of launching products uh, and uh, the kind of the ESG regime and new kind of environmental and sustainability laws. Uh, I will now hand back to Ed to get us kicked off on the, the actual presentation. Okay, um, can we move forward? Slide, thanks, Virgil. So um, we uh, we wanted to cover three main updates that, that Jamie outlined uh, uh, today. Um, but before I go into the into the sort of dive into the detail on, on those updates, I also wanted to touch on some of the um, the drivers that we're seeing for for the reforms. Um, so we really very much detected a number of themes um, that sit behind the developments we're seeing coming out, out of Europe at the moment. Um, and I want to just say a few words about those um, and, uh, and the sort of trends that we're seeing. Um, so uh, taking taking a few a few examples from the slides here, um, we're very much seeing that, that the circular economy is uh, prompting a number of reforms um, which are aiming to move Europe to a, a more circular model where products are designed for reuse and repair. And that's leading to uh, right to repair legislation, um, new design requirements. We've seen a, a, a quite a strict new regulatory regime for uh, batteries, uh, which contains uh, uh, removability uh, requirements, for example. Um, but it's also leading to adjustments on the liability side to address issues like um, the liability of, of third party repairers. Um, likewise, uh, new technologies are very much in, in the spotlight uh, at the European level. Um, including connected products and uh, also products that incorporate AI systems. Um, and they're really prompting reforms which are designed to address the evolving nature of those products, uh, products which uh, continue to change once they're placed on the market. Um, another uh, uh, sort of key area of concern at the moment are new marketing structures. Uh, and, and what we really mean there is, is the, rise in, uh, the rise in online sales. So uh, there's a particular focus on responsibilities and liabilities of online marketplaces at the moment and what role they should play in uh, in the regulatory uh, framework so um, I was also just going to touch briefly on um, the, the consumer power empowerment piece um, certainly something that that we'll be talking about today with the new class actions uh, mechanism 
but there's been a real rise in um, in, in consumer uh, protection legislation in, in Europe, and that's really prompted by uh, by two things. First, a trend um, towards uh, ensuring uh, better access to justice for European consumers, and, and secondly, uh, an idea that it can help to uh, plug the enforcement gap. Um, Europe's uh, regulatory regime is getting ever ever more complicated, and uh, enforcement is is generally lacking behind. Um, the scope of the ambition on the, on the regulatory side. And so increasingly, uh, European policymakers are seeing a role for consumers in, 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 in that enforcement piece. Uh, just the last two uh, themes I wanted to touch on um, are resilient supply chains. We're seeing um, concerns at a policy level around uh, ensuring uh, supply chain uh, reliability for critical uh, materials, particularly in tech. Uh, so it's used, uh, materials like cobalt and, and lithium uh, as well as ensuring supply chain um, uh, robustness for uh, semiconductors and, and, and amongst other things. And finally, ESG, um, uh, hardly any um, uh, policies are released at the moment without, without some reference to ESG, as there's an increasing concern at the policy level about ensuring that uh, regulations are, are, are made with a, an eye to the sustainability and the impact of, 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 what, um, of what they will achieve. So um, with that in mind, um, I wanted to move on to this slightly uh, intimidating uh, next slide, uh, which, um, which sort of summarizes some of the key changes we're seeing coming out of Europe. Um, I think this slide, uh, although not too easy on the eye, uh, demonstrates the, the, the volume of change that we're seeing in, in Europe, um, which is just completely unprecedented in, in, in any time, certainly in, in a, more than a decade that, that I've been practicing this area. And, um, and really at any time during European uh, uh, policy history. Um, and what's more, um, without wanting to, um, uh, to be too alarmist, this is just a selection of some of the key um, uh, changes that we're seeing coming out of Europe. Um, so there are a lot more that aren't on this slide, um, and we really are seeing uh, a huge um, uh, change and an incredibly ambitious uh, agenda uh, at a policy level at the moment. So obviously we don't have time to, to cover everything on this slide today, and um, we're always happy to take questions um, uh, on anything if, if you have them. Um, but we've just chosen uh, three of the sort of landmark changes that we'd like to, to discuss today. And with that, I think we can move on to the, the next slide, um, which just outlines the three areas we're going to uh, we're going to focus on today. Starting off with the general public safety regulation. Um, the sort of key framework piece of uh, legislation in, in Europe. Uh, moving on to the product liability directive, uh, the strict liability um, uh, regime that we have, uh, have here in Europe. And finally, ending up uh, with uh, the new EU class action mechanism, which is a real first uh, for Europe and, and a real um, significant change. Uh, so we wanted to spend some time uh, discussing that. So perhaps I can hand over to uh, Fergal, uh, who will cover the general product safety regulation. Thanks, Ed. Uh, much appreciated. So, uh, yes, I'm going to start by covering off some news which is hot off the press. Uh, just eight days ago, on the 12th of June 2023, the General Public Safety Regulation uh, entered into force. I'm sure there are a number of people uh, on this call who, who are covering this quite closely, uh, and indeed the Cooley team have been involved in the kind of uh, back and forth with the European institutions over the past two years. So it's fantastic that it's now entered into force. And we're really, really excited about kind of describing some of the changes uh, which, will, which will occur as a result of the GPSR. Although there is an 18 month uh, transition period, meaning the provisions will only start applying in full as of kind of December 2024, for most product manufacturers and distributors, you know, there will be adjustments which need to be made now to ensure compliance further down the line. And uh, as I find every year, the, the end of next year comes around uh, particularly quickly. So I'll be covering off some of the key requirements and also kind of giving some practical tips as to how we, um, uh, how companies should address these. So before we dive into the details of, um, of what, when and how the GPSR will start to apply, it is worth considering how we got here. So the GPSR has been a long time in the making. It's been uh, more than a decade since proposals were first uh, made to reform the long-standing GPSD, the General Product Safety Directive. And so it represents a really significant achievement that is now over the line. Uh, the reforms were, were really prompted by the kind of changing world that we live in. 
uh, with attempts to reform the existing GPSD, gathering real momentum as concerns around new technologies and on -sale, online sales grew. Along, alongside these, in the course of various EU consultations, there were a couple of other challenges raised with the existing GPSD. And these included things like uh, ineffective product recalls, the kind of complex market surveillance rules that, that kind of Ed uh, addressed earlier, and the legal form of the rules themselves. So the kind of fact that the GPSD was a directive, uh, whereas the GPSR, uh, which is now being introduced as a regulation and all directly applied. The fact that it was a directive led to some sort of uneven transposition and implementation across the EU member states. Now, as ever with the EU, multiple options were considered for how to improve the existing rule, and the, you know, they considered uh, enhanced enforcement of the current legislation, targeted revisions of the GPSD to just address new risks, or a full revision to basically recast the law as, as a regulation, increase its scope, and include additional requirements. Now, given Ed's kind of non-alarmist but slightly alarmist uh, overview of what's happening in the EU, um, you can kind of guess the option which is which is chosen. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to determine that following a couple of years of debate, the European legislative, legislative institutions settled on the last option and a full revision was carried out and the GPSR has now been adopted. So in short, what, what are we looking at? Well, the key, the key points are as follows. The GPSR reforms EU consumer products law. It fully repeals and replaces the GPSD. It is a regulation, uh, and if you're not aware, that means that its provisions are directly applicable across all EU member states after it enters into force without the need for these to be transposed into national law, so unlike a directive. And it brings consumer product regulation into alignment with other EU regulations and introduces new obligations and concepts, many of which we'll cover today. So on the slide in the wider the matter section, we've outlined five of the kind of key changes. I will speak to some others, which, which didn't make, make it onto the slide, um, but these are the things which we think are the, kind of the most important changes in the GPSR. So number one, starting from early in the product life cycle, the GPSR introduces additional factors to take into account when determining whether a product is safe. Now, these are quite wide ranging and they include the different impact on health and safety of different genders, uh, the risks of the risk posed to the most vulnerable consumers, uh, and like a particular focus here on children, connectivity and interconnection with other products, the effect of software updates, uh, cybersecurity, and the evolving learning and predictive functionalities of a product. Now, I referenced in the kind of introduction to this that new technologies was a key driver for this reform. And one can see that focus on new technologies as you consider the larger list of factors which companies now have to take into account. And this is not just emphasized in the legislation itself, but it's also uh, emphasized in the recitals to the legislation, this kind of like the text which precedes the, the legislation, which provides kind of guidance. Um, but by way of example, um, the recitals expressly note that any assessment of safety should take into account the health risk posed by digital connected products, including to mental health, especially to vulnerable consumers, in particular children. Looking at the second significant change, uh, we, we, we think the, 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 sorry, the second significant change focuses on the alignment of certain requirements for harmonized and non-harmonized products. Now, previously, the requirements for non-harmonized products, i.e. products which don't fall into the kind of new legislative framework and don't require CE marking, were quite different to harmonized products. But following the introduction of the GPSR, new requirements have been introduced which align these two sets of products, so the alignment between harmonized and non-harmonized products. Now, these requirements include a requirement to carry out an internal risk analysis and draw up a technical file and keep it updated for non-harmonized products. There are stricter requirements for labeling and traceability information. And there's a requirement to have a responsible person established in the EU alongside certain labeling obligations for that party. Now, what does this mean in practice? Well, essentially, it means that companies which previously produced products rel with relatively light regulatory requirements in the EU may need to reconsider their approach to, to meet these kind of new strict requirements. Uh, the third, third significant change is that the GPSR introduces mandatory accident reporting. We're actually going to do a deeper dive into this uh, on the next slide, so I'm going to leave that for now. The fourth significant change is that the GPSR introduces new requirements for recalls. Again, I kind of preface this in my introduction that um, one of the concerns 
in the EU was that the kind of recall effective, effectiveness rate was, was relatively low. Um, so the GPSR has kind of introduced changes which they hope will, will boost that effectiveness rate. And these changes can broadly be split into three sections. Uh, the first is changing with regards to advertising recalls. The second is changing changes with regards to recall notices. And the third is changes with regards to uh, recall remedies. And as you'll see, as I go through these changes, they're largely consumer focused. And again, they're focused, like very focused on increasing the effectiveness of, of recalls. So the changes, changes for advertising recalls include requirements to directly or directly notify all affected consumers that can be identified without undue delay. Disseminate recall notices through various channels, including, for example, the company's website, uh, social media, retail outlets, media announcements, uh, and, and others. And offer customer registration for product safety issues. The changes in respect of recall notices. So if you've launched a recall, the notices which you launch that launch alongside your recall include mandatory messaging to consumers, including, by way of example, an instruction to immediately stop uh, using the recall product. Prohibition on the use of certain terms, including voluntary, uh, precautionary, in rare specific situations, or uh, or kind of an indication that there have been no reported uh, accidents in the notice. And finally, uh, the EU intends to produce a template which will kind of uh, be adopted by an implementing app, and that will be the kind of standard form for recall notices going forward. Finally, in terms of recall remedies, the GPSR now requires consumers to be offered a choice of at least two of the following remedies, repair, replacement, or refund, unless impossible or disproportionate, in which case uh, one can be offered. And if a refund is uh, offered and required, the purchase price must be offered with no deductions for use. Uh, the final point on kind of recall remedies is that the remedy cannot entail a significant inconvenience for the consumer. So for example, the consumer is not to bear the cost of returning the product. Last but not least, a whole chapter of the GPSR is dedicated to online marketplaces and their responsibilities in the market. And these are really, really groundbreaking changes. So once again, there are a whole series of new requirements for online marketplaces, including requirements with regards to dangerous or unsafe products. So for example, requirements to notify of dangerous products on an online marketplaces platform and to respond to notices from authorities. And alongside these and among other things, there are requirements for online marketplaces to establish a single point of contact for market surveillance authorities in the EU, publish information about recalls, and design interfaces to enable traders to display information required for online offers. And that's kind of covered separately in the GPSR. Now, this is by no means a, a complete list of changes in the GPSR. Of the other changes, I think the most significant thing that we want to emphasize is that there's, alongside these kind of a broadened scope and, and additional requirements, there's an increased emphasis on enforcement and penalty. So, the GPSR contains a, a tougher enforcement framework with higher penalties, and as, as I think Ed will probably touch on later, uh, the potential for class actions. So with regard to increased enforcement, the GPSR includes a requirement for the Commission to organise on a regular basis joint activities between market surveillance authorities, uh, an obligation on market surveillance authorities to carry out coordinated sweeps of particular products or product categories, and provisions focused on international cooperation, which we I think we've seen that over the last kind of five to ten years, an increased drive towards international cooperation between the Commission and the international regulators. Penalties are, are left up to the discretion of member states, um, but the Commission notes that they must be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. So turning to our next slide, uh, we're going to do a deep dive into kind of accident reporting, which again is a, a really, really key change in the GPSR. So the GPSR introduces a mandatory obligation for manufacturers to notify the authorities via safety gate, the kind of EU's internal mechanism uh, for, for notifying of, of dangerous products or unsafe products. And they, they require this notification if there is an accident caused by a product. Now, there is a threshold to trigger the reporting obligation. Uh, which is actually unlike the Commission's original draft. They, they wanted all accidents caused by a product to be notified, which I think would have been somewhat overwhelming. So, so only accidents need to be, the, the accidents need to be notified only if they resulted in an in individual's death or in serious adverse effects on their health and safety, permanent or temporary, including injuries, other damages to the body, 
illnesses and chronic health effects. So even though there is this kind of reporting, uh, sorry, the, this threshold, it does still lead to lead one to consider that there would be like a, quite a large number of potential accidents included in this, especially if, for example, injuries, other damages to the body are considered as at a, at like a low bar. The time limit to file a report is without undue delay, undue delay from the moment the manufacturer knows about the accident. Uh, once again, this is quite heavily, heavily debated in the EU. The Commission's original draft was that the report should be filed within two working days, a, a very quick timeline. Um, and it's currently unclear how the kind of without undue delay language uh, and the kind of lack of a clear timeline for reporting will play out. And uh, arguably, it could be good for manufacturers as if, for example, they fail to meet a, a specific timeline, they could still argue that they uh, reported without undue delay if they have the kind of evidence to demonstrate why why their report was filed perhaps later uh, than uh, expected. It is also somewhat unclear when, how and when a manufacturer will be deemed to have known about the accident. For example, is this from the time a customer service agent was first notified of the accident or is it from a period of thereafter? And it will be really interesting to see how this all plays out in practice. The obligation to report uh, sits with the manufacturer. However, uh, it's important to note that where the manufacturer is not established in the EU, the responsible person in the EU, which has knowledge of the accident, must ensure a, a report is made. And finally, uh, as I referenced above, there, there is a separate obligation for online marketplaces to report without undue, without undue delay if an accident that they've been informed of resulted in serious risk to or actual damage of the health or safety of a consumer caused by products made available on their marketplace. So again, it's a really, really like uh, significant change for online marketplaces in the EU. Um, and they'll have to kind of put into kind of procedures in place to ensure that they're able to kind of make these reports once they are notified or if they are notified by consumers. Uh, moving on, just touching on kind of how, uh, how long basic companies have got to prepare for this. So the, um, the GPSR has now completed the lawmaking process and it's entered into force, so, so there's no more negotiations ongoing. It has a transition period of 18 months, which means, as I said before, that the requirements will start to apply um, and be enforceable from December the 13th, uh, 2024. So it seems like quite a, a long way away, but actually, given the kind of scope of the changes and, and the fact that kind of uh, new procedures may need to be put in place, uh, it's actually not that long. Um, so we suggest that companies are, are kind of prepared as far in advance of the state as, as possible. Okay, I'll now hand over to Jamie, I think, who's going to lead us through the PLD. Thanks, Fogel. Um, so before we get stuck into the proposals, I'm just going to first take you back to, to where it started. So the Product Liability Directive, or PLD, was introduced in Europe in 1985. And it was a legislative response to the thalidomide tragedy in Europe, where the drug's use during pregnancy led to a range of birth defects. At the time, the claimants had to rely on the tort of negligence and were unable to make out their claims. So the PLD was intended to meet that challenge. PLD establishes a framework for strict liability for defective products across the EU, meaning claimants do not need to establish fault to claim successfully. As a result, it's the preferred way of making product liability claims in Europe. To ensure a balance between claimants and manufacturers, a claimant must bring any personal injury claim within three years of the date they became aware of the damage, the defect and the producer. And on top of that, liability is extinguished 10 years after the product had been placed on the market. The law had provision for review every five years to ensure it was fit for purpose in light of technological changes. And for a long time, the conclusion was that no change was required. Now, it was not until around 2017 that the European Commission first made serious strides to reform the PLD with an evaluation of the directive. And this led to a number of work streams, including an impact assessment, public consultation, and the appointment of an expert group. And now, almost 40 years after it was first introduced, we have a proposal for a revised PLD. As Ed mentioned earlier, the key drivers for change are a range of factors, including the technological change we're starting to see all around us. Many reflect the increased digitalization of society, and include technologies such as AI connected products, just data security risks, and the innovations associated with e-commerce. 
unlike the thalamidomide crisis, in many cases, the proposal is not a response to harms that have already occurred, but rather a reaction to concerns of future harms. Given the pace of technological change, we're seeing this approach carries risks if the harms do not occur as expected or different harms occur. Now, the revision matters because if implemented, it will extend the scope of claims that can be brought, expand the range of damages that can be recovered, make it easier for consumers to prove their case. And whereas the original PLD was lauded for achieving balance between all stakeholders, the new proposal promises to tip the balance in favour of consumers. And taking each in turn, so how's the definition of product changed? So the current PLD broadly applies to tangible products, and that arguably extends to software incorporated into tangible products. The proposals would bring a much larger co cohort of products into scope. They, they explicitly include software, whether embedded or standalone, digital manufacturing files, such as CAD files for 3D printers, and certain digital services. So this is very broad, but includes navigation data for autonomous vehicles, AI training data, uh, voice assistance, uh, or health monitoring services. So what other claims can be brought? So the current PLD limits claims to manufacturing or design defects, or arguably a failure to give adequate warnings. Now the proposals would also impose strict liability for cybersecurity and connectivity risks, as well as issues arising from the, absolute, from the installation or absence of software updates. And in certain circumstances, liability would continue to apply when a defect came into being after a product has already been placed on the market or put into service. So software updates under the manufacturer's control, which we'll take a deeper dive into on the next slide, the failure to address cybersecurity vulnerabilities and machine learning issues. So there will continue to be responsibility for emerging technologies that learn independently and for certain updates or lack of updates that will be imposed on manufacturers. So has the scope of damage expanded? So damages currently recoverable for personal injury or losses to private property with a minimum threshold of 500 euros. So that's roughly $550 at today's exchange rate. The proposals will expand this out to include claims for data loss or data corruption and certain recognized psychological injury claims. And some, pro pro um, some professional property claims will also be brought into scope where there's mixed private or professional use. And finally, the minimum threshold for claims will be removed allowing many low value claims to be issued. And this could have significant repercussions for the representative actions regime as it will enable group actions for lower value claims. And finally, how does it make it easier for claimants to prove their claims? So the proposal introduces two key changes to existing laws. So firstly, uh, courts can order discovery. Now for common law jurisdictions such, such as the UK or the US that are familiar with disclosure, that may not seem like a major development but it promises to be a game changer in jurisdictions that do not currently have disclosure obligations. And secondly, the proposal introduces measures to alleviate the burden of proof for claimants by introducing presumptions for defect and causation. So defectiveness is presumed when a manufacturer fails to comply with the obligation to disclose information or a product does not comply with mandatory safety requirements such as those um, in the proposed AI law or other safety laws, or whether damage is caused by an obvious product malfunction. Um, and a causal link is presumed when damage is typically consistent with a defect in question, or technical or scientific complexity causes excessive difficulty in proving liability. So an example that's commonly given is black box AI systems, where the output of the AI system cannot be explained. Now, the manufacturer retains the right to contest the existence um, of difficulties in achieving the burden of proof or to rebut the presumptions, and there are provisions to protect trade secrets. Now, this is obviously a very significant change and will likely be very attractive to consumers. We expect that given their potential impact defendants, um, on defendants, the, the scope of the presumptions will be the subject of, of litigation in due course. Now, the PLD is within the scope of the new EU representative action regime. I don't, don't want to spoil Ed's presentation, so we'll just say for now that this is a big deal with the potential to transform the approach to liability claims across Europe. So now we'll move on just to have a deeper dive um, on one of the novel aspects of the proposal, which is the introduction of the concept of manufacturer's control. 
So this is designed to address a feature of new technologies that enables manufacturers to continue to exercise control over products once they've placed them on the market. So for example, via software updates or related services. So the proposal attempts to ensure that manufacturers remain liable to the extent that the defect was introduced as a result of those updates or services. The intention is that the manufacturers remain liable for updates or services they supply themselves, as well as third party updates authorized by the manufacturer. And the precise wording of the clause is currently the focus of debate, with the European Council proposing amendments that would significantly expand that definition. Under the proposed definition, it also includes situations where a manufacturer consents or has the ability to authorize or consent to the supply of the updates. If you follow this through, it's arguable that all third party apps on app stores operated by the manufacturer of the device are within the manufacturer's control because apps can only be made available on such app stores by authorization of the app store owner or the manufacturer. Now, subsequent communications from the Commission suggest that control will be a key factor here. They suggest that a manufacturer will not be liable for updates added outside its control. But going back to our app store example, in the absence of clear guidance, the level of scrutiny of third party apps by the manufacturer will become an important issue. In an increasingly digital society, this promises to be a major issue for manufacturers, as many will look for opportunities to develop their own app stores. And however, the drafting of this provision lands, it will not be without increased risk for manufacturers. So now we'll just say a few words about next steps and um, expected timing. So the Parliament and the council will now propose their amendments to the commission's proposal. And then they'll all three embark on a series of meetings or trilogues to negotiate a final version. It's always difficult to predict timings, but current thinking is that the agreement should be reached by around mid 2024, if not a little earlier. And once adopted, there will be a transition period. Now, the precise period is still being debated with either 12 or 12 months being proposed. Sorry, 12 or 24 months being proposed. And that suggests we could see the new PLD enforced between late 2024 and late 2026. So in summary, the proposal is regulating future risks that may or may not arise given the pace of technological change. However, if the proposal comes into force broadly as drafted, which is expected, it's likely to have a big impact. We can expect to see a lot more product liability claims in Europe covering a wider range of products, novel risks, and more losses being claimed. Claimants have uh, been given more tools at their disposal to advance their claims, which may encourage early settlement in a lot of cases. And when combined with the representative actions regime, the European product liability landscape could look very different in the near future, which takes us neatly over to the next presentation. So over to you, Ed. Great, thank you very much, Jamie. Um, I, so I wanted to say a few words on the new uh, European Representative Actions Directive. Um, this, is a, this is a major change in, in Europe, as, as, as both Jamie and, and Fergal have alluded to, um, uh, as it introduces class actions for nearly half a billion EU consumers um, across all 27 member states. Um, this is really novel stuff for Europe. Um, Europe's been looking at class actions for uh, decades now, um, but has been reluctant to import uh, the model from, from the US. It's always, always had some concerns about, about the, um, uh, the litigious nature of, the, of class actions, um, but really off the back of Dieselgate, it um, decided that action was needed and it's um, sort of reluctantly brought in this new mechanism uh, which will bring class actions for the first time. And, and we say it's a game changer because um, before um, the advent of this new mechanism, only three jurisdictions in Europe had a, had a full sort of uh, representative uh, action mechanism. So um, for the 24 uh, other member states that, that haven't seen this type of mechanism before, um, this is a big change. Um, I should also say that um, this creates two different types of, of, of class action mechanism. So even in the member states where, um, which already had some kind of class action mechanism, there is a new mechanism too. Um, so let me just give a, a quick overview of the different types of uh, mechanism that are available. First of all, the, um, uh, the directive brings in um, a cross-border mechanism, which would allow consumers um, uh, in, for example, Germany, Italy, France to sort of club together and bring consumer claims um, for consumers in all of those member states in the courts of just one member state. 
Um, that's important because it allows uh, for a degree of forum shopping. Um, so um, uh, they're likely to pick pick the uh, pick the jurisdiction with the with the most favourable regime. Uh, the second mechanism is the national mechanism. So every single member state will be obliged to bring in a new class action mechanism, uh, which allows consumers to bring bring claims in their national court. Um, the claims can be brought by qualified entities. Uh, qualified entities are um, a, a, a sort of specific uh, jargon uh, uh, within the representative actions directive, but essentially they'll ordinarily be consumer organizations. Uh, which are qualified to bring this type of this type of representative action. I mean, in terms of what the what the scope is, um, it's it's pretty significant. So uh, the representative actions directive covers um, around 70 different pieces of legislation um, covering European consumer rights legislation, product safety legislation, uh, medical devices, uh, medicinal products, uh, data protection, um, uh, amongst many others. And we're really seeing that um, as uh, as new legislation comes through, it's increasingly being added to, into scope. Um, so uh, I know we've already mentioned today that the new AI laws, uh, for example, are, are being added in. In terms of uh, what you need to get get one of these actions started, the threshold is pretty low. Um, uh, it's just sufficient to describe uh, the the group that's affected by the alleged infringement, and set out at a very high level um, the issues of fact and law that need to be resolved. And that's important um, and deliberate. Um, because it means that class actions can be brought very quickly uh, off the back of uh, well-publicized incidents. Um, so uh, we expect these uh, class actions to be brought in Europe off the back of recalls, uh, for example, or other uh, well-publicized non-compliances. Uh, given the audience, I wanted to say a few words on how this compares to the, to the US model uh, you'll be very familiar with. Um, and as I sort of mentioned already, that. European um, policymakers were very reluctant to bring uh, into Europe a full US model, um, uh, and they've taken a number of steps which are designed to um, sort of guard against what they see as the as the sort of uh, worst excesses of the uh, the more litigious US model. Um, so a couple of examples um, of that: um, recovery of damages is limited to actual loss, no punitive damages uh, under the European model. Um, and class actions can only be brought by these eligible uh, consumer organizations that I referred to. They must be non-profit um, and they can't be law firms, uh, which is seen as a, as a key uh, protection against sort of development of a, of a European plaintiff bar. Um, in practice, I think we've got very real questions about how effective those, those uh, sort of guardrails are going to be. Um, first of all, uh, uh, tackling the sort of punitive damages point, um, there's certainly no punitive damages, and, and, and I don't think we expect to see jury awards comparable to US proceedings anytime soon in Europe. But it's a huge market um, uh, with, as, as I mentioned, nearly half a billion uh, consumers across Europe. Um, and that means that in practice, um, the types of claims that will be brought here will often be small per claimant uh, uh, amounts, but ones which really add up to a, a very significant um, uh, damages award when, when, when looked at as a whole. Um, then, as regards the sort of protection around not allowing plaintiff law firms to bring these directly, um, in practice, that's a bit of a legal fiction, um, because whilst um, they can't bring these claims directly, there's nothing to stop consumer organisations instructing plaintiff law firms to assist them with these actions. And in practice, that's exactly what we've already seen in, in, in the few member states that do have these um, uh, uh, mechanisms in place. And of course, what will be, um, what we will continue to see uh, under the new mechanism. So, um, what we um, what we've seen off the back of, of Dieselgate and expect to continue to see as a trend is, is is a number of key plaintiff firms working hand in glove with with consumer organisations to to identify and bring claims that are amenable to to these class actions. Um, and it's fair to say that we're not the only ones that are that are thinking like this. Um, uh, it's not just European uh, claimant firms that are that are seeing the opportunity here. There's been a huge influx of, of US plaintiff firms into Europe in the last few years. Um, it's really a re remarkable um, change in, in the environment, um, as well as a huge influx in, in, in litigation funding. Um, 
Uh, I was uh, at, a, at a class actions conference about six years ago in Amsterdam that was overwhelmingly um, uh, dominated by, um, by small boutique European firms um, who did uh, this type of work. Uh, and I, I returned uh, last year to the same conference uh, and couldn't believe uh, how the sort of makeup of the, of the attendees had changed. It was dominated by the big names from US uh, plaintiff firms um, and, uh, and there were uh, litigation funders buzzing around um, uh, uh, in, in discussion with those, those plaintiff attorneys um, uh, looking out for the, for the next claim. So um, the, the, the environment's really changed here in Europe and it's, it's really important um, for our US clients to, to take stock of that. Um, talking of litigation funding, um, it is permitted under the Representative Actions Directive. Um, there are certain transparency provisions around um, uh, requiring to disclose um, uh, uh, that litigation funding and some protections, but they're very limited. Um, so for example, uh, it can't be funded by a competitor, um, uh, but it, it certainly opens the door for litigation funding, uh, which is important uh, in terms of, of the trajectory we, we see uh, of these taking off. So in summary, even though the, the EU has sort of taken a slightly like, different approach to the US um, when it comes to the, uh, the, the class action uh, regime that's being introduced, um, the mechanisms will undoubtedly create a much more claimant friendly environment for class actions. Um, they're going to be a game changer. Um, this, is a, this is a mechanism that hasn't existed in Europe before. And there's no doubt that um, uh, claimant law firms will be looking to use it. And that, that bringing large collections of, of, of product liability claims, amongst many other types of claims, will become a much more viable prospect um, going forward um, uh, for consumer organizations and, and a much more threatening one for businesses as well. So I was going to say a word on uh, timing and, and current status um, uh, before I uh, before I wrap up. Um, the uh, legislation entered into force actually in, in, in 2020, um, but there's been a bit of a, a sort of phony war since the legislation um, was published. Um, it's a it's a directive. And so uh, it requires implementation by, by every member state and, and member states have been working to, to implement this. So it actually goes live on the 25th of, of June um, in, in theory, um, although a number of member states are actually um, late in their implementation. The Commission is very serious about um, making sure that the mechanism is available for European consumers as soon as possible. And it's uh, taken action to issue notice on any member states that are lagging behind in the implementation of this. Um, so uh, we, we have seen a, a large number of member states bring in these mechanisms um, and they will be ready to go live uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, a small number of, of member states uh, are taking uh, rapid action to, to bring them online um, now as a result of, of, of the um, sort of increased pressure from the, from the Commission. So um, there is no doubt that um, class actions have arrived in Europe. Um, and that, that, that any uh, company that sells products in Europe uh, needs to be aware that the uh, risk of, uh, of class actions now in Europe is a, is a real one um, and that these types of claims could be brought against them either directly um, uh, out of circumstances arising in Europe or also um, the trend that, that, that we've seen even, even before the advent of this new mechanism um, be exported um, uh, from, from US proceedings. So a lot of um, uh, plaintiff uh, firms in Europe are really keeping an eye on, on what's happening in the US, um, what the trends in, in, in class action litigation are there. So any um, company facing a, a class action lawsuit in the US should really um, uh, be getting advice at a very early stage uh, if they've sold products in Europe, because there's a very real risk um, that those claims will, will, will also move over to Europe. So um, I'm mindful that that's a fairly quick uh, canter through the, the sort of key um, elements of the new um, uh, directive. Um, I'm very happy to take questions on, on the on the detail of that or, or of anything else um, we've covered today. Um, I want to keep things snappy uh, for you because um, we're mindful that you've got, you've got lots of other things to do in your day, but, um, but please uh, ask away any questions. We um, are available to stick around and, and deal with those. Okay, thank you all. Um, we, uh, we will get to some questions here. I just want to let everybody know one, I'll remind you, hopefully you remember that all the slides will be posted uh, on the SPSV website, as well as a link to this program so others can view it later. 
so hopefully you didn't madly scribble down all these slides that they uh, they kindly provided to us. But uh, let's get into some questions. Uh, Fergo, can you go back to the, uh, the the general product safety regulation slide? That first slide, some uh, some questions there. Uh, particularly on the timing. Yeah, let's see. Let's, yeah, that one right there. Okay. Um, so you know, number two, you're talking about a pre-market risk assessment. Now in the US, we're not generally required to do pre-market risk assessments. Uh, in the EU, uh, is this a new requirement that you have to do one? Do you have to document it? Do you have to give it to anybody? Or is it just uh, saying that if you do one, there are some new requirements for it. Yeah, good question. Uh, and I think I can answer that. So this is a new requirement for non-harmonized products. It already exists for harmonized products, conducting a risk assessment. Please, please Jamie and Ed, feel free to chip in if, if, uh, if I go astray. Um, so it exists for harmonized products. So for products which are which require CE C marking and are within the kind of new legislative regimes. So if say you have a product which has kind of Wi-Fi functionality or, or um, is under kind of the radio equipment directive or the low voltage directive, they already require a, a risk assessment. And this new requirement only applies to kind of the, the other products which fall out of that regime. And, that, and now they will require a risk assessment as well. So there's that alignment. My understanding is that you don't have to give the risk assessment to anyone but that it will form part of your technical file such that if it is ever kind of if, if you have a problem in the future and your technical file is requested from a kind of a, a market surveillance authority that would form part of that technical file that you'd hand over and it could be analyzed then I, i'm pretty sure that's right but, but jamie and ed do you have any other further comments on that no that all that all sounds um spot on so the uh, i guess the sort of overarching thing here is that 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 the products have that haven't been CE marked in the EU are are very much um, moving closer to the to the requirements of of CE marked products. Um, there is a, um, a some recognition of um, uh, sort of differentiation based on on risk in terms of um, how, um, how how substantial your evidence needs to be um, when it comes to that uh, that technical file and, and and how you've considered the risks of the product. So. Um, for more complex products or, or, or more dangerous products, you will need to do a greater degree of, of, um, of testing and due diligence uh, prior to launch. Um, but it's fair to say that the, the requirements for many products that, that don't fall within the, the CE marking regimes are, are, are really stepping up as a result of, of these changes. So if, you do a, if you're doing a pre-market risk assessment in the U.S., Presumably, you can use that for the EU risk assessment, although I guess you need to look at the requirements, whether it's a harmonized or non-harmonized product, and certainly you would want it to, to have one risk assessment for everyone or for all locations where, where you have it. And, and of course, that document would be discoverable in litigation wherever you have it in the, in the EU or uh, in, in the US or Canada. Um, so on a timing basis, uh, the, the timing is interesting, but are you required, let's assume that you uh, haven't done a, a pre-market risk assessment and you want to start doing it. Are you required to do it for products you sell after the effective date of the regulations or do you have to do it now? So the requirements apply on a, on a product by product basis. Um, uh, and that means that if you've already got a, a model line on the market, then um, specific units placed on the market after that date will require uh, uh, will be required to meet meet the new requirements. Um, that means in practice, if you if you haven't got this um, this kind of evidence or this this sort of risk assessment in place for existing model lines, you, you will need to do that. Um, uh, it's not the case that um, uh, products that are already placed on the market will, will need to meet um, uh, the new requirements. It doesn't apply retrospectively. So if you're no longer selling a product, um, then, then you don't need to go back and, and adjust your paperwork. Well, but what, let's say you have a product on the market, so you don't have to go back and redo th these new requirements, but you're going to modify the product in the future. Do you have to then apply the new requirements? What if it's the same product, you're just making an improvement? New products, certainly that, that would make sense, but just how about a modification of an already existing product? Do you have to apply the new requirements? 
yeah, very likely to trigger um, a requirement to, to reassess um, uh, the risks. And even, even under existing law, if you, if you make a uh, European law, if you, if you make a significant change to a product that might affect the, the safety of that product, then you're likely to have to, to revisit your, your initial risk assessment, your initial conformity process. Um, and that's very much because the, um, the European approach is, is one that, that takes a unit by unit approach. So it doesn't matter if you've been selling a, a product for 10 years, if you make a change, and you, keep, you intend to keep selling that product, then you need to, to revisit your assessment. Okay. The responsible person, designating a responsible person in the EU, um, does that have to be somebody who's located in the EU or can it be somebody in the US who you've assigned the responsibility to be familiar with EU requirements? I, I, I believe that person can has to be someone who's established in the EU. So yes, they should be based in the EU and not a US party who is familiar with the, the EU requirements. Now, when it says responsible, it, it, I mean, so uh, I mean, there are penalties for non-compliance. Is that person responsible for <laughs> penalties? I mean, you know, US companies who sell through distributors in the US, I mean, in the EU, you know, could designate a responsible party. And, uh, but who's responsible for the penalties in the event of non-compliance? So the Europe, yeah, yeah, well, the European regime has a sort of hierarchy of responsibility, um, and the responsible person will have regulatory responsibilities that are set out in the Act. Um, they're also set out in the market surveillance regulation, um, which was brought in the last uh, couple of years. Um, so uh, it's certainly the case that they they will have um, regulatory responsibilities, and they're also looking at um, uh, uh, liabilities under the under the product liability directive for. Um, both responsible persons and potentially authorized representatives too. Um, so yes, um, they will need to carefully consider um, uh, what what kind of regulatory and liability um, uh, they're taking on when they're um, deciding who who picks up um, responsibility within within the supply chain. Okay. Now, uh, we had a question here. Article forty four of the regulations leaves assessment of uh, penalties for non-compliance to the member uh, states. I think you said that. Um, I mean, do we know what the member states are thinking about as far as penalties? Are there amounts that they're thinking about? Are there ranges? So, And when would they be applied? I mean, I can see situations where one member country is, uh, and I think we have this today anyway, is that the, there are some that are much more rigorous in applying the, the non-compliance penalties, or they expect you to do things faster or more completely comprehensively. Uh, so how do, we, how do we deal with all these countries? Absolutely. You know, the, when you consider the EU, you're considering a 27 country market, and each of those has an independent regulator, and each of those regulators acts as their own entity and will have kind of different uh, regimes and, and different funding and different numbers of people who are able to kind of deal with these requirements. We, we at Cooley, you know, we can carry out kind of EU 27 approaches, but we do also recommend kind of targeted approaches for specific regulators. So we know, for example, that the French regulator, the German regulator, the Italian regulator can be particularly active, whereas some other countries, either as a result of funding or as a result of um, kind of their interest in product safety may be less active. Um, the caveat there, I would say just on this point, is that kind of the GPSR does move towards or, or does kind of push regulators towards kind of better international cooperation. So I think those kind of easy delineations of, oh, this is a high risk market and this is a low risk market don't necessarily exist in the same way anymore because you know, if you have a, a lot of international collaboration, you could get actually queries from a number of regulators where you don't anticipate that because they are leaning on the resources of another another regulator. Do you, um, think, it, do, do you think these uh, government authorities are going to issue, uh, you know, guidances or thoughts or, or, or some kind of a paper so that companies understand what that particular country's authority expects? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm sure we'll get a, a level. I, I don't know what the penalties and individual penalties are yet. Unfortunately, the UK isn't in the EU anymore, so we don't, we don't have a, a kind of a marker from the UK. Uh, I can give you kind of a, a kind of understanding from what the drafts suggested previously. I think um, the kind of discussion between the Commission, the Council, and the Parliament looked at some very significant penalties, here, like up to I think it was four percent of, of global turnover for for certain offences. 
which is obviously massive, you know, and that could be a really, really substantial issue for, for certain US clients. You know, whether kind of the member states follow that approach is, is TBC, I think, uh, but we could, we could absolutely try and find out some more information for you on that. You know yeah, what? and it's fair, it's fair to say that this was something of a political hot potato um, during negotiations. Um, so the commission was determined to bring in uh, a much more um, robust enforcement mechanism, um, hence the proposals of GDPR style um, uh, turnover fines. But um, uh, penalties have traditionally been a, a member state competence. So um, it was uh, politically um, uh, sort of contentious for uh, the commission to be to be proposing to harmonize in that area. Um, uh, so there was a there was a fair bit of pushback and the eventual sort of compromise uh, text that we've got um, encourages member states to ensure that that penalties are, are dissuasive, um, but doesn't specify the sort of the, the minimum amounts. Um, we will see, I think uh, Phil was absolutely right in saying we will see um, guidance developed uh, at member state level um, around what, what those penalties can be. Um, we won't see a, a, a consistent approach, though, um, because, uh, it, because they haven't taken that harmonised approach. I think it's fair to say that if there's any um, real standout um, uh, 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 member states in terms of not having sufficiently uh, robust penalties, the, the Commission will likely take action. And there are mechanisms under European law to ensure that member states uh, implement sufficiently um, uh, national me mechanisms that sufficiently reflect European requirements. Um, I don't expect we'll see that, but, but that, that will be in the back of um, member state authorities' minds when they are developing those guidelines. Okay. Just a note, it's uh, two minutes after the hour. Uh, we advertise this program to go to 15 minutes after the hour, so hopefully you'll stick around. I, I knew there, there could be lots of questions and discussion. We weren't sure how long it would take, so I've, I've, I've allotted a few more minutes to, for questions, so we'll, we'll continue on with that. Uh, you know, on the issue, and I want to talk about reporting, but before I get to that, Fergal, you mentioned that you, you know, uh, the UK is not part of the EU, so uh, what, what do we have to worry about? I, I know you. I know we're not going to have a whole new s series of regulations. But what uh, you know, what are you guys doing to try to, I guess, harmonize your regulations with uh, the EU's new regulations? Ah, oh, that is a million dollar question, Ken. So <laughs> that, that, that's not a quick answer, I'm afraid. So, so let's concentrate on the GPSR initially. So the GPSR, to be expressly clear, does not apply in the UK. It it, it um. It was adopted after the end of the transition period and, and it does not form part of UK law. Well, what that means is that the GPSD or the kind of national implement, national transposition of the GPSD does apply in the UK and will continue to apply until it is kind of replaced or repealed by something else. Now, what that thing is, um, is, is very much TBC. I think I, I don't know that the kind of UK is consulting on a, a similar law like GPSR. I may be wrong. Um, uh, again, Ed and Jamie, please let me know if, you, if you're aware of that. But um, the UK is definitely keen to still be seen as a leader in consumer product safety. So you know, if you have a more um, challenging regime in the EU, like the, I suppose it's a kind of a, a question for the, for the government and the political system as to whether they want to be seen as kind of a, an easy mark in the, in the UK. Um, I don't think there's anything currently being negotiated which um, looks substantially similar to the GPSR. Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. I think the only thing I'd, I'd say is, I mean, the the British government's been um, fairly consumed with sort of negotiating the exit from the EU for quite some time, and then obviously with COVID, and now it's sort of starting to look at its own product safety review. So, sort of, it's it's had some um, initial sort of conversations with stakeholders around what the future uh, product safety framework should look like in the UK. Um, there is an expectation that there will be a consultation launched soon. It's been soon, I think now for about six and a half months, uh, but it still hasn't been launched. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's likely to cover exactly the sort of things that um, have been picked up by the changes in Europe. Um, so, you know, online marketplaces, looking at new technologies. Um, so we're sort of um, circular economy, you know, all the sorts of issues that are affecting um, sort of global product safety issues that we're, that we're seeing. And um, although 
I think the government obviously wants to do something very different to the EU because otherwise, what's the point in leaving the EU if you're just going to do exactly the same thing? So um, we're expecting to see something relatively similar, but also with some important differences as well. Okay. Now, there are two other areas that I want to quickly get into that, that are really important for us US folks uh, as they apply to both our US responsibilities and, and the EU and, and UK responsibilities. First is the, the new requirement to report. Um, you know, in the US, we're required to report to the CPSC if there's a defect in the product which could create a substantial product hazard. Now, that clearly means we don't have to have an accident. And many reports are made to the CPSC where there's been no accident, but there could be. Um, here, the focus, and I think this, it's the same generally in Canada, is the focus is more on where the accident has occurred. So let's say I've got uh, a, a, uh, no accidents in the US. I, I determine I, I need to report to the CPSC and I wanna do something about, about the product to, to try to prevent any future possibility of injuries but I haven't had any accidents anywhere in the US or Europe or anywhere. Do I have a duty to report in Europe? Now, who, who wants to take that one first? Yeah, I'm, happy, I'm happy to, whatever, sure. I have a go. And then you can, all, <laughs> you can all jump in. So, I mean, this is obviously, this is a new, uh, a new reporting regime that's, that's being proposed, but there is an existing uh, risk-based regime that exists in Europe and that's that's a long-standing regime and so there's a there's a um, unlike in the US there's a sort of very well developed risk assessment methodology that's followed by companies um, that kind of many listeners will be um, familiar with the, the safety gate or the RAPEX regime and so you know what that does is it looks at what the hazards are you know what's the risk and the probability of an incident occurring now you don't necessarily have to have an incident in order to go through and, and to conclude that some sort of action is necessary and a report must be made. Um, I mean, often you, you, you do, do tend to see that, but of course there are exceptions where there are cases where there's just such an obvious risk. Um, you know, often perhaps there'll be a you know, failure to meet standards and that's been picked up at an early stage. And so a company will decide um, that yeah, action needs to be taken a report and a report must be made. Okay, now the term without undue delay is about as vague as anybody could get. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, that uh, it makes the CPSC seem clear in their regulations about when you have a duty to report. Uh, how do we figure out what that means? And, and again, going back to what I just said, let's say we've reported to the CPSC, but we haven't had an accident in Europe. We're not sure if we have it. I mean, should we be reporting to the EU also, even if we haven't had accidents? And at what time do we have to do it? What's the undue delay? That's, uh, you know, if, particularly if we've already reported to the government in the US. Yeah, so I think, oh, sorry, I had to go for it. Yeah, well, um, please chip in, um, Fergal, as well. I, I think it's fair to say that there remains a, a, a degree of um, uncertainty about the requirements here. Um, we do expect um, guidance to touch on this issue. Um, so uh, we hope that there will be greater clarity. Um, the uh, language that we have in the eventual um, GPSR is, 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 again, the subject of a compromise. Um, stakeholder feedback on um, uh, at the two-day period that was originally proposed um, was very much that that, that wouldn't allow um, time to investigate whether um, the accidents were real, um, whether they were they were genuine, um, whether they were actually related to the product, um, uh, et cetera. The normal kind of steps that, that companies, uh, uh, responsible companies take when they receive a, a report like this. Um, and so the, the compromise language which was arrived that was without undue delay. There are, of course, a, a range of interpretations um, you, you can take to that language, um, whether that leaves scope for you to, um, to, to verify um, information about that accident um, and exactly when the, when, when the trigger uh, uh, sort of starts, it, whether it's the, 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 the mere knowledge of the accident or whether it's knowledge of a sort of confirmed accident. Um, I think a lot of these questions remain a little unclear at the moment. Um, uh, but we will see, I think, over the next um, uh, six months to, to, to a year after the um, application of the new provisions, um, both some more clarity in, in the form of guidance, but also in the, in, in the form of uh, market practice. Um, and that's something very much that we'll be monitoring to see how regulators are approaching this. Um, 
uh, whether they're taking inspiration from jurisdictions like Australia that already have um, sort of strict incident reporting uh, requirements, or whether they're taking a, uh, a more practical uh, approach, more based on um, allowing time for, for businesses to, to investigate and, uh, and um, verify uh, information that's received. Well, and I, I think we'll have you guys come back next year and you can give us the, <laughs> An update. the information yeah. <laughs> that's been developed. So this is a good start. So this is just the start. Last question, Jamie, I think you can answer this one because you were talking about the product liability directive. Uh, you know, in the U.S., product liability litigation has you know, skyrocketed, uh, you know, over the decades, you know, partly because of contingent fees by plaintiff's lawyers, the, the, the threat of punitive damages, um, the discovery, the jury system, all kinds of things that make uh, product liability in the U.S. very interesting and uh, uh, very risky. Uh, you don't have the, quite the same things in Europe. You have it over the years and, and in the U.K. Um, how much litigation is there? How much do you expect there to be? And, uh, you know, are, are countries going to be allowing punitive damages, I think UK now allows contingent fees, if I'm remembering correctly. So, I mean, are you going to get closer to our system so that it's going to be as risky there as it is here? Or is it still going to be not, not quite as, uh, as uh, exciting as we have here in the US? So, that's a big question to end on, Ken. So, thank you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I... I mean, it's, it's very hard to say. At the moment, we, mm. we certainly don't see the same level um, of litigation that you see in the US for product liability disputes. Um, you know, there's all sorts of reasons, you know, as the points you go to, that, you know, the law firms aren't incentivized in the, in the same way to bring the claims. You know, the people receiving the claims don't get such large awards. Certainly in the UK, um, there's the risk of, of adverse cost orders if you, if you lose, which is a real disincentive. Um, but I think what we're seeing with the changes that are being introduced, we're expecting there to be an increase for sure um, in the um, product liability lit lit litigation. And, you know, I think predominantly that's just because it's just a little bit easier for claimants. There's a broader range of claims they can bring. Um, the, the sort of the evidence that they, they need, there's, there's these presumptions that they can rely on that will just make it a little bit simpler for them to make out their case. And so, you know, the burden just slightly shifts. And, and I think for a lot of companies, they'll be thinking, well, do we really need to be settling these disputes rather than going all the way? Because, you know, you've got these new disclosure obligations, a company that's never faced a disclosure obligation before, suddenly going to be pretty concerned about what that means, what it's, you know, could that mean future claims? And that would be a real driver, I think, um, towards, towards settlement. So whether we see the same sort of jury awards, I don't think so, but I certainly can imagine that we'll get into a world where there'll be more claims brought, they'll be settled probably a little bit sooner. Um, yeah. And certainly, sorry, and, and finally, on your on your point on, um, on, on on damages, punitive damages, that isn't really something I think that, that we'll, we'll see um, here. It doesn't seem to be, you know, we, I think that'll be one of the sort of elements of the US regime that we're not looking to replicate. Now, to go back to what Ed said, that, that there are a lot of U.S. plaintiff's firms now opening offices in Europe, or at least in the U.K., maybe. Um, and I think that's what we have to really be worried about, and that is that they're going to be developing either litigation, they're going, to, they're going to be more familiar with what the company is doing in Europe and the U.K., and try to use that information in their U.S. cases to try to support punitive damages, to try right. to say, this is a bad company. Look what they did in Europe. Uh, now, they may or may not be able to get that into evidence, but uh, you know, the fact that they're over there, they're familiar with the laws, they're going to try to paint a company as a bad company that doesn't care about safety. They can try to use information wherever it's developed, uh, anywhere in the world, to try to, to portray that company as, as a company that doesn't care about safety. So I think that, that the opening of offices in, 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 the, in Europe by these plaintiff's firms is not a, it doesn't bode well for what possibly could happen either in Europe or in the US. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. And I suppose the other thing that just occurred to me is, you know, a lot of them will, will sort of start lobbying efforts. You know, they may just see this as stage one. You know, of course, there's lots of scope to expand the rules, you know, and um, the European um, institutions are susceptible to lobbying. Um, so, you know, it, this could just be, we may see in sort of five or 10 years, actually, you know, there are elements that are being introduced as a result of that sort of lobbying. So, you know, I don't think you can rule that out either. 
Okay, uh, Fergal, could you go to the last slide shows your contact information? Um, I, I'm sure you'll have questions. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully Ed Fergal and Jamie, uh, who I thank you very much for being here today and, and participating. And that's how you can contact them. And uh, if you have some specific questions, again, the slides will be posted. The uh, link to, the, uh, to today's program will be uh, posted. Uh, and we, there might be some other written material that uh, the Cooley folks can provide us. They're willing to provide us that we can put up on the website that'll uh, give you a little bit more information uh, as we move forward. As I said before, we will revisit this issue next year in the webinar series. With, uh, and uh, so get, keep, uh, keep aware of this, be aware of this. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully SPSB will try to help you be aware of these issues and, and uh, provide information that will uh, allow you to, to comply with these requirements and, uh, and minimize your risk going forward. Thank you all again, and thank you for uh, everyone for sticking around till uh, till 15 minutes after the hour. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.